This episode of the Dental Insiders Podcast has been brought to you by Ignite DDS, fueling passion beyond the classroom for future dental practice success. Learn more at IgniteDDS.com. Part two of our interview with Mike Cataldo, CEO of Convergent Dental. So um, earlier we were talking about, um, you know, entrepreneurship and, and, and your experience as an entrepreneur and, you know, most dentists, they fall in that category of, of entrepreneurs. Um, you know, they, they have their own businesses, they, they take risks. Um, you know, you as a successful entrepreneur, what, what advice can you give on entrepreneurship to dentists or industry people like Matthew and myself, you know, about being successful? Well, you know, it's, uh, it's not that complicated of a formula. It's, it's pretty simple. You got to have a great product, as I was saying before. The product actually has to work. It has to deliver on the promise that you make when you sell it to people. That's number one. Uh, number two, um, you've got to make sure that you take care of your customers after the fact, right? And then, you know, three, of course, you, you got to have a good, you got to have a good financial equation. You know, but that's, I mean, that's the, you know, the overarching, you know, those are the overarching keys to success. For, for building a great business. There's a lot around employees and good leadership and we, we can talk about that, but I, I don't see what I do to be successful, to be any different than the successful dentists that we see out there, right? They offer a great product. Uh, they stand behind it, right? Something goes wrong. You make sure you take care of the patient, the customer, right? Um, and um, in the course on an ongoing basis, you, 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 you take care of them, right? So, so it, you know, it's a little different in dentistry, but it's all, it's as simple as having a great product, standing behind it and, you know, taking care of your customers. So have you always been in your, in your previous life before this, have you always been a bit of a risk taker or is that, is that, is this a risk even? Is, is your current deal a risk or was it so calculated that you knew it was going to work out? You know, you know, that's actually, there's a lot more to that question than you think. Um, so I suppose if you asked other people, if I was a risk taker, they would all say yes. If you asked me if I'm a risk taker, I'd say, uh, not really. I mean, you know, I used to tell people, they say, well, what's the, you know, what's the difference between somebody who starts their own business and somebody who doesn't? And the answer is one person started their own business and one didn't. I don't see it as that different, but you know, so for example, you talk about when you're recruiting employees, is there, a, is there a big difference in risk between going to work for an early stage company or a big, you know, an IBM or a GE or something like that? No. In both places, you could lose your job, right? So it's just the way I look at it. Um, are there real risks? Of course there are real risks. Uh, when we started this company, uh, Long River Ventures and myself funded it. I wrote a check. I wrote a big check. They wrote a big check. The risk was there that we would it would never see the light of day. We hadn't even really built a prototype yet, right? But on the calculated risk side of it, you know, you do do a certain amount of homework. Uh, you know, I did a lot of research. I, you know, read all the same research that came out of UCSF that my partner Nathan read, got to know all the science. Uh, I studied the market, the size of the market, what had gone right, what had gone wrong with other technologies, specifically lasers. And I could see a path through that. And to me, um, sure, there's a level of risk to that. But as you work down that path, the risks come, literally come off the table. So, for example, they're, they're a long list of them. So one's technology risk. The technology risk is can you make the product work? Well, when you start from scratch, you don't know the answer to that question. So one of the first things we did was build a prototype. Right. And then we made the prototype work and it became very clear that we could build a full working system around it. That risk comes off the table. Uh, another risk in our case is regulatory risk. You built a, a prototype, but can you get regulatory approval? So we just like we do when we build a product, we got really serious, did our homework, worked with the FDA to make sure we understood exactly you know, the process for submitting a high quality application. We submitted it. And we were actually approved in 90 days, start to finish, 90 days done. And we did that with soft tissue, then we did it again with hard tissue, then we did it again with osseous tissue. All three were 90-day cycles, right? So those risks came off the table 
once again, you know, we didn't know when we went in, but we had a good idea. We put a plan together. We worked through it, didn't kid ourselves, didn't try to kid the FDA, and through you go. And then there are funding risks. There are staffing risks. There are you know, market adoption risks. You can go through the manufacturing risks. You know, all those things are, you know, are risks that we faced as we developed the company, but we very methodically, you know, attacked each one. And thankfully, we're successful at taking them all off the table, right? So, yeah, uh, I guess I'm not afraid of risk, uh, but I do uh, put some thought into it before I take one, right. which, I suppose, which I suppose helps. Yeah, yeah. That's great. So um, another thing we talk a lot about here is uh, entrepreneurism is a theme, but yeah. so is mentorship. Yeah, I think we talk about mentorship almost every episode. We do. It's important. I think you and I are looking for mentors. That's, uh, I maybe, think, I maybe, this that's is, maybe this is a cry for help. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so um, I'm sure you've had mentors in your life. What lessons do you, do you use today that you kind of pass along to, to people that work for you or, you know, you cross passes? What, what are some of your business like axioms that you just, just believe are important? Oh my goodness. Huh. My business axioms, uh, you know, that's, that's a really long discussion. Um, but I have the people who work here would tell you I have all sorts of them. You know, one of them uh, is pay attention today do it better tomorrow. That one I probably say more than anything else. And it, there's a lot baked into that, right? Pay attention really means pay attention to the good and the bad, right? right. So for, for example, you could get all sorts of input from a dentist and you could just take that and bake it into your product. It would likely be a terrible idea. Not that dentists don't give us great ideas, they do. But you have to pay attention to what the dentist is asking for and figure out how to translate that into what is actually going to be useful to them and the product, in the product and work for the company and work for the patient, et cetera, et cetera. That's the pay attention part. And then you can, then you can actually do something productive with it when you put it into the product. Another thing is, you know, be willing to face your mistakes. I mean, just pay attention, right? If you screw something up, you got to kind of lean right into it. Don't try to sugarcoat it. Oh, what I really meant was, or I was trying to do this. It's like, the hell with that. What did you actually do wrong? And what can you do to avoid doing that again, right? Another one is, you know, it's okay to make mistakes. Just don't start a streak, right? So, <laughs> you know, these are, that's you, a good one. you know, that's one of them. But, but I will tell you, I keep looking to the, to, the, to the left over here because on my wall over this computer, you know, Cataldo's axioms or tenets are actually written on the wall. There, there are about a dozen of them. So I do have them. They do exist. Um, and where they came from, by the way, is I, um, you know, I had some mentors. Uh, I listened to them. Uh, I can remember experiences which weren't so pleasant where I made a mistake and I paid very close attention because I never wanted to do that again. Um, you know, so I've had them, and what I try to do as much as I can is to coach people on my team and recognize um, places where I can help them improve and, and coach them, teach them, right? I mean, an easy one is you hear a salesperson and, you know, sometimes they'll get a little excited and, they'll, you know, they'll want to say, you can see it coming. They want to, to sell this thing at the peak of its capability, you know, the best possible scenario. And I'll, I'll probably say, come down, calm down here. You know, you've got a product that's tremendous already. Just sell it for what it is or a little less, right? Calm, just a little calm helps a lot, right? Um, you know, same thing in marketing where, you know, you, you see people and they're, you know, they kind of running off with a product idea or product plan. It's like, slow down. Let's break it down. Let's do the analysis. Let's go through it. Let's see look closely at the situation, see what's kind of written between the lines and um, we can do much better as a result. It's, it's a constant process, constant process. Right. My, uh, that's actually not far off from my favorite axiom. Yeah. Mine is there's no education in the second kick of a mule. <laughs> <laughs> that's, it, that, that's true. 
it's a cousin. That's a cousin to pay attention today and do better tomorrow. tomorrow. Right. Yeah. yeah. That's and it. You definitely don't want a streak of being kicked by a mule. No. 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 You no. spend a lot of time around mules. <laughs> no, and nor do I want to. Okay. So yeah. I, I don't want to have a streak of spending time around mules. Um, we talk also on the Dental Insiders a lot about technology. Yeah. Um, you know, so in your personal life, what is a piece of technology that you just cannot live without? Hmm. Well, you know, everybody says the same thing, right? I mean, how do you live without this anymore? My, you know, one of my greatest fears when I leave the house, I'm like checking my pockets and I get, if I don't have this, I'm in a lot of trouble. Right. So, um, you know, that, if I had to say, that's the one I, 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 I really can't live without. Other than that, I have a bunch of tools in my, my shop in the basement that um, I attempt to make furniture with. I can't live without, but they're not very high tech. And I still have all my fingers. <laughs> all right. Yeah, that's, that's good. That is very, very important. Yeah. Yeah, that is important. Um, you know, going back to the, to the topic of, of, of mentorship and, and, and mentoring, you know, employees and, and things of that, you know, what, what's your favorite book on business? What, what, what business book do you recommend to, to people that, that, you know, are looking up to you as a mentor? You know, I got criticized recently and was told to get out of the 80s when I answered that question. But um, there, there, are, there are three uh, books that I recommend to pretty much everybody. Uh, one is called Crossing the Chasm. It was written in the 80s by Jeffrey Moore. You guys are nodding your heads. You know the book. We have the book. Right. Yeah. But it's, it's a very relevant book. And by the way, what that book is about, it's about patience. It's really about patience and about listening. And, you know, so what Jeffrey Moore did is he really paid attention, right? And so, you know, and, that, and I think everybody understands that what we're talking about, it, it, well, maybe they don't, is the progression from innovators to early adopters to early majority, late majority and laggers, you know, more risk, you know, less risk averse buyers to more risk averse buyers. And while the product could be exactly the same, and it is, as you go through these phases, uh, it's important to speak to the market in the language that they can understand in the phase that they're at. And by the way, we have seen that in spades with Solea. Our first dentists were classic innovators. Give me the technology. I don't care whether it works or not. I like it. I want it. Give it to me, right? The next phase is the, I can envision how to use this to grow my business or whatever the advantage was that they were looking for. But I can see the advantage, by the way, better than you can Convergent Dental. And by the way, this phase, they adopt the technology. They tell us how to do it. Regardless of what we teach them in training, they don't need any training. They just figure it out. Now we see another phase of dentists that want to see, um, they, they want to see the return on investment. They want to understand how it's going to work in their practice. They require more training, more detailed training. They want a recipe. They don't say, just give me the ingredients and I'll figure it out. They want that. And as a company, we've evolved both on the sales messaging side and on the client services side to accommodate each phase of the market. So, and I think that's a huge part of our success because you can't figure everything out on day one. But what you have to do is you have to watch the market for signs, and it's not always obvious while it's happening, um, of what you need to change in order to be successful in that phase of the market. So crossing the chasm, to me, is a, kind of a, a staple that every early stage technology entrepreneur should absorb completely. Um, another couple, you know, a couple more, um, another old one. Uh, by Michael Tracy, and I chuckled because he lives right down the street and I've met with him a few times, is the discipline of market leaders. And it talks about developing a core value proposition of either um, operational excellence, customer intimacy, or product leadership, right? And I won't get into the details of what each one is, but if you can really focus in on what your priority is and still support those other two at, at, at a level the market requires, it allows you to be more efficient and build a product and a team that can support it. Uh, that's a great book. Um, and, uh, and I really, I really, uh, 
I preach, I, I preach about that one a lot. Um, the other ones, I mean, there are a couple of other ones. Positioning by Jack Trout, which is a, a, once again a really old one, and um, there are a couple of other. Um, you know, building trust, growing sales is a great book about consultative selling. Uh, I think the lesson in that one, and we really try to adopt that one here, is we don't try to sell the product. We really don't. It's not just a word consulting. We try to help dentists figure out how to evaluate lasers in general. And then we show them what we can do. And it's a more informed purchasing process. And the customers, uh, when they become customers, are more comfortable with their decision as a result. And especially because we do back it up with that guarantee. Uh, it's essential that we don't just sell them a laser, that we work with them to make sure that we put something in their practice that fits for them. Because we're the ones at risk at the end of the day. Yeah. So. Anyway, that's a list of a few books pretty quickly. But um, I think, uh, you know, those are, you know, th those are my favorites among many. Right. Nice. Well, we were, you, Michael and I were both nodding um, on the crossing chasm because we, a mentor to both of us is, I think, the same person that recommended that book to us 15 years ago was Stefan Hain, yeah. who was a boss to Michael, who ran CAD CAM for um, CEREC for many years. Um, and he was a boss to you, but he was a client to me. Yep. And I remember, I remember in the, it wasn't the pitch meeting. It was, it was actually the discovery meeting where, so I was at an agency and we were there just trying to gather information. And he said, well, I want everyone in this meeting to go read this book. And in a week, we're going to come back here and we're going to do this meeting. And yep. we all went and read the book and, and, and it changed, it changed everything on how the questions we were asking, yeah. where we were trying to get to and how we were talking to, uh, um, the consumer, you yeah. know, to figure out yeah. where we were. And Sarek's a good example of, of, um, you know, of, of a product that is, has crossed the chasm. They are, oh, at the time there. they hadn't. Right. They have since. I mean, that, that, cat that category is, is, is an excellent, um, example of a chasm crossing exercise it is you know and um and it's and and the, you know we're both nodding our heads when you mentioned that book because i mean even <laughs> even recently uh, you know uh, on, on my website i i you know have a, a, an article where i try to frame things in terms of jeffrey morris crossing the chasm because it is so you know even though yeah it was written um i guess in the in the 80s or or, yeah. or maybe even late 70s i can't remember it you know is so applicable to a lot of uh, what we deal with on a daily basis, right. uh, dental technology. Right. Yeah. It is. So so are you? Would you say you are? You're still in the early, the early adopter phase. Are you past the? Are you in the innovators or where are uh, you? We're we're actually starting to see more early majority. Wow. Um, than we are. Yes. There's no question about it. So, like I said, I mean we have had to really, um, like you, you know how I was mentioning. Um, the difference, the, the fact that it's very helpful to talk to dentists about efficiency gains, but also adding new procedures to their repertoire. We, we actually have to paint that picture piece by piece in terms of, you know, how you add more procedures on the efficiency side, how you add more procedures on the adding new procedures to your repertoire side. And by the way, you know, the third practice growth driver is adding new patients. We have to have more facts. We have to have actual data, as I was referring to, from our own dentists that, um, you know, that all speaks to the more conservative early majority buyer who uh, is interested in, you know, more of the facts, less of the theory, and um, more risk averse when it comes to new technology. So, and again, on the implementation side, we used to, I mean, we thought our training was great. Our first 50 dentists just jumped in and immediately went up to 95% anesthesia free. It's like, wow, we get the best training in the world. Then you start to see, as you get into a different phase of the market, that that training just did not work. Right, and we had to switch the training around and make it more structured and a little more cookbook and provide some more data because this phase of the market needs more of that. So there's no question in my mind that we're into the early majority market at this point. Wow, and you know that 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 comment there about the the training just makes me go back to the note that I wrote earlier: pay attention today, do it better tomorrow. Oh, there we go. Live, words to live by, and you know what? It's okay to make this one. I love. It's okay to make a mistake. Just don't 
Start a streak. That's right. Now we've got a streak going here on the Dental Insiders, and um, we do. Hopefully, it's not a mistake. Yeah. But um, we're going to continue this streak, and we really appreciate you joining us, uh, Mike. This has been um, an awesome um, yeah, great. conversation with you, and um, again, just thank you so much for spending some time with us today. Well, gentlemen, the pleasure is all mine. So, thank you. you know, I think that wraps it up for another episode of the Dental Insiders. Uh, we, of course, like to thank Mike Cataldo, CEO of Convergent Dental, for joining us. And thank you, our lovely audience, for spending some time with us. Please join us next time and tell your friends and colleagues about the Dental Insiders. Thanks, Mike. Thanks. Thanks, guys. All right. Thank you.